coconut trees that grew there regularly. And it set up half, uh, half down in the ground along with the sand and everything else. And uh, some of our shells would hit it and it wouldn't even splinter. And before we arrived, even the day before or so, some Army B-24s were supposed to come in and obliterate, as they say, we will obliterate this island. Didn't happen. Everybody was there. The only thing our, our Navy shells did was disrupt their um, uh, connecting electrical system, that, uh, getting a hold of each other, so that the commander wasn't always able to get everybody doing exactly what he wanted to do. That was the one benefit of the, sh the showers. Going ashore, they had the best defense I think I could have imagined. The, um, now, was this on base show? That was on base show. No, okay. our, our particular group, our particular group was uh, held in abeyance out in the water in those little uh, boats. And we were supposed to, the next morning, after we got the all clear from base show, we were supposed to go into the, all the other islands. Well, they didn't. At one night, one day from morning, noon, and night, the section where we were supposed to maybe have to come and land, they had only advanced 15 yards from the shore. 15 yards. Other parts had gone a little deeper, and the 2nd Marine Regiment had gone in rather deep. So instead of going to the other islands, we were told to come in at the next morning, 7 o'clock. And so we did. Now, the, the, uh, the ocean was very shallow in the lagoon. Uh, the information that they had gotten from the Australian authorities who owned the island before the war was, um, uh, had nothing to do about this. And they're coming in the shore and the boats can't get up there. Our group was dropped off 700 yards. And so when we would go towards the beach, we didn't stand up because the crossfire was tremendous. Sprayed all over. They hadn't been knocked out at all. So, and especially we a little bit in the, uh, uh, the infantrymen would be just a little ahead of us, but we were all in the, in the, in the lagoon. And I know I used my carbine for a walking stick, so to speak, over the the beach underneath, which was a lot of rocks and everything else, and you, you would uh, maybe keep moving towards the beach slowly, but the water line would just to be about here, just under your nose, so you could breathe. So give them the smallest target you could. And then we got ashore closer to, that we dropped off at 7, and we probably were closer to about 11. They had a big pier that they came out there. And we got in the t tail end of the fire this outside of it, and then kept coming in along the, under the pier and round it as protection until we got to the beach. Uh, there were bodies all over the floating. It, um, it was an unholy mess. Now that was my first campaign, and uh, it uh, certainly was a shock. But it, you're trained to just keep going, keep going. You got a job to do. And that that night, uh, we were all down in the. Um, uh, actually, we we're in places there we couldn't dig in. There was we were still on the shore. Unusual situation. The second day. We moved out over the 15, past the 15 yards. We were finally getting into some of those uh, entrenched positions that the Japanese had done so well at. And knocking out a few here and a few there allowed us to get a little bit deeper. And right in front of us there was a uh, palm tree. And that morning they shot a sniper. He had gotten up there during the night. Went through everybody, climbed it up there, and was way up in the in the frowns of the uh, palm tree, shut him out. And then slowly, ever so slowly, we would keep moving, keep moving. Now, I was a mortar man, but 
in a situation like that, there was no use for a mortar. So what we did, we were just part of the infantry. We just kept doing what everybody else did. And uh, humorously, uh, you gotta, you got to find humor in, in battle. you got to find humor uh, in wartime, sad as it is. And we came across a shell hole and had exposed at the bottom a cache of Japanese bear. So the line was, wasn't moving much at all. So about uh, three or four of us was it down in there. And we opened up nice, warm Japanese bear and it tasted delicious. And then soon after, we were going on with everybody else. And everybody stepped in and did a job of their own. I remember I was assisting in the, uh, one of those uh, tank jobs, that, uh, not tanks, but those uh, Caterpillar type trucks where they had a they had a, a can on the board and then I would help the guy getting his ammo so he could pour it into the in the artillery piece and shot right right we were right in front of one of those broken built in places. Uh, the probably of all the campaigns I knew about, uh, either in Europe or uh, in the Pacific, probably never before and maybe since did the fire throwers, the flamethrowers have such a beautiful day. Because the one thing the way you could hit all these people down in the ground is at the entrance, you you blast it in with your flamethrower. It burned out all the oxygen. So these soldiers inside, even if you didn't shoot them, they suffocated. They had no oxygen to breathe. And slowly, 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 in campus and got more and more into there. They had big artillery pieces that they had taken from Hong Kong when they took that over the year before. They were built in. So they, they, it was a beautifully designed defense. I, I've always thought that if the Navy and the Marines had that island, the Japs uh, in reverse would have never have been able to take it. Mm -hmm. We did, but it was one hell of a time. And my particular uh, battalion, even though uh, I was 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, even though uh, we came in the second day, we had the highest loss percentage of anybody. We landed with 800. We landed in the water, not with white. We landed in the water at 800. And by the time, 52 hours later, when everything was over with, uh, we were down to 450. So it took you know, just over two days yep. before you were able to wrap it up. Let's see. Late morning, yep. Now, this this island, was there a name for the atoll? Tarawa. Tarawa. So it was one of the uh, islands within the Tar Tarawa Atoll. Yeah. The Tarawa yeah. Atoll may have not been, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I mean, yeah. 20 little miniature islands. Mm -hmm. One on the end, Basho or Helen, as we call it, that was a key one. Were there other islands in the atoll that the. No trouble, they were all natives. All natives. So this yeah. is when the people who are familiar with war movies, etc., hear Tarawa, it's really ba Basio. Yeah. I say, okay, that's where the. Okay, so how long did you stay on Basio? Well, we were out. We got out of there pretty darn soon. I don't think we, I think by one day more and we were out of there ourselves being reloaded aboard the troop ship and then we uh, sailed off to the Big Island of Hawaii. Hmm. And this was to R&R? and r, &R, or? r, &R and um, uh, start looking forward to the next one. The, uh, we well, landed at Hilo and and uh, went ashore, and we were we were down in that open. That that's the big island of, of Hawaiian group, mm -hmm. and uh, we you could see Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea right from our, where we were. The uh, the casualties, you know, your fifty percent casualties. Do you know how many of those resulted in death? Our total death, the total death in those. 
three days total. We lost um, just under 1,000 dead and 2,300 and 2,300 wounded. Wow. And that's one division. Yeah, but it's, you know, for we who, you know, are familiar with Tarawa and that uh, through the movies, it's still such an impact when you hear the real numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, no time for woe with me, that's for sure. And uh, they did well. I, I'm proud of that, that bunch. They did very, very well. Okay, so we we're, we're now in Hilo. Yep. And how long did we stay there? In Hilo, we were there, let's see. That was late November going into December. And we had another campaign coming up uh, in uh, middle of June, so uh, we were on, we didn't rest very long. I'll tell you, we were we were training all over again. A little bit of mixture, and then we got more and more intense in the uh, in the spring of '44. And this training was in the Hawaiian Islands. So yeah. yeah. Did they? Uh go through landings again and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yep, yeah, we uh, did landings. Um, we uh, didn't do as much as we did for uh, for Tarawa. Um, uh, certain amount of practice going ashore, we were always, we were always, uh, that was our specialty if you want to call it that. We were uh, very good at, at, at landing parties and stuff like that. Is there anything you can think of that changed as, you know, improvements that were made in the, the landing procedures that, you know, from the first one to... Well, I, you know, I, I think you've got, uh, I think the defense is what makes your offense. If it, It's just like if you're coaching a football team and if you're standing over your next opponent, he's weak on this and he's very strong at that. Um, you decide where you want to hit, and it may be much different from any previous campaign. Now, what they had planned, of course, was Saipan, which, which was going to be a much bigger island and a much bigger show of force from the Allied side. We ended up with two Marine divisions, the 2nd and the 4th, and the Army 27th Division. Well, Saipan is a part of the Japanese islands, isn't it? They're Part of their chain? Uh, yes, it, it, they had had it for they had it ever since I think 1918. Okay. It had been a German island before I think, and they had uh, Shamaros were the natives there. Some of us, of course, in the, that dilapidated, you know, uh, when you're in a situation of filth and dirt and grime and all that, I remember seen some chamarros there at Saipan that come out of the, they go hiding in the caves and they come out and I remember that one woman, I looked at that young lady walking by and I'm telling you, I don't think there was anything in Hollywood that surpassed that. Mm. <laughs> uh, so you spent, as far as I can see, maybe six months in Hawaii? Well, we were a month of sea on sea, so we would have left uh, maybe the very first of, uh, of uh, uh, the, we would, would have had been, we landed there on the 15th of June. And I remember when we were uh, on board ship and we heard about the big invasion of Normandy and we were eagerly listening to everything we could on the radio about that, that treat us no end, that was wonderful. And uh, prom and I know we were uh, uh, on the seas a good month because I read two big books at that time. Uh, one was the story of the Mayo Brothers, of the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, my Minnesota, and uh, the other ones was a, a book by a famous sociologist 
um, concerning the minority situation in America. He was from Sweden. And the minority situation in America, how the blacks have gotten better and better and better and better. And um, it was a big, big textbook. And I had time to read all of that. And I'd say we have a good month because I think they had put together the the uh, time schedule in, in Hawaii uh, admirals to bring them together in with all the troops of the open seas and then go in there the same way. Okay, so now we're uh, going to Saipan. Mm -hmm. And what happened at Saipan? Saipan was, as far as landing on the beach, was easy. It was nothing compared to Tarawa. Um, we, um, the second and fourth, went toward the northern part of the island. We came down towards the southwestern part. We landed. There was, there were no chaps there. No, nothing out anywhere around there. And um, um, we would go inland, and it was only that night. We didn't get any, receive any, any firing against us at all. Uh, that night, though, as we bunkered down, why, uh, we had uh, some shelling come into us. And one thing about us, compared to, let's say, the troops in Europe, the Army, you would get, over there, you'd get used to shelling. One thing we did not have was shelling in the, in the Pacific area to speak of. So, that was something novel, and, and you did feel this quickly get over it, but you get this feeling that, gee, I'm barren. I've got no defense against this. I, I'm just rolling dice. Whatever happens, happens. It wasn't much of an, uh, a barrage or so, but it was enough to we re remembered it. And then slowly, we were at that time now, we were in an independent battalion. 1st Battalion, 29th Marine Division. This was to be the plan, new division to be formed in Guadalcanal after Saipan and Guam was taken care of. And it was compiled of uh, men from all other five divisions and uh, coupled with new recruits coming in from the shore and was to be the 6th Division, which later was to go to uh, Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And so we were an independent battalion, but attached to the 2nd Marine Division. One unique thing about us is that we were the connecting link between the 2nd and 4th Divisions, the Marines, and the 27th Division, which was on the eastern side of the island, 27th Army Division. And uh, uh, you could you could see a, a definite difference in techniques used. Uh, it was uh, was not a uh, anywhere as near as pressured uh, and tact that you would have at, at Tarawa and places like that. So we would go forward, and, and uh, it so so happened we were consigned the job. They had this one island on the on the island. They had this one mountain, Mount Capacho. Really wasn't that tall. It was all made out of coral, pushed up, you know. Do you remember how to spell Capacho? T O P O C H O U. I'm guessing that. Right. Okay. It's, it's in there anyway. Right. Capacho. But anyway, our job was, uh, along with one other uh, battalion of the 4th Division, we were to meet at the very top and get the Japs out of the top, because this way you could survey, survey all over the island and see everything that's going on. And uh, one, uh, one thing uh, that happened on the way up was uh, uh, something that was tragic and yet uh, memorable. We were, we were uh, going up, and I remember passing a built-in uh, uh, artillery piece, built in the ground, concrete and all, and it was, the breech block was taken out of it, probably by the Japs, I don't know who. And we went on and on our the approach to the uh, mountain, we bivouacked uh, for the night, 
and we were in a bit of woods. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, we were, the Southern Jairene and I were digging our, our fox hole, not too far away from the captain of our company. And then up comes the First Louis, uh, who had been a guard on the um, champion uh, Texas A&M team in 1941. And uh, he was with our Master Gunny Sergeant. That's what we called him in those days, the Master Gunny Sergeant. The Marine Corps was more important to us than any officer beneath captain. Only a captain could maybe equal and maybe a major just beyond that. But the Master Gunny, to us, he was our father. And so we came up and we were a third down in our foxhole and digging and uh, says, sorry guys, we've got to, I've got to move you. I've got to be next to the captain for eventualities. So we moved off to an open spot there. We dug down and put ourselves in for the night. Well, that night, whether it was the um, uh, artillery piece we, uh, we passed up, or what, I don't know, but all of a sudden we got unusual shell. And that poured down. Now, being that we were in trees, the ideal shot for the enemy would be if a shell could hit a tree, then all the shrapnel would rain down. And being in a foxhole wouldn't be that great of an advantage at all. Well, that morning, we heard moanings, not much of anything could be done. That morning, uh, the other Jirene and I were both hit. We later became the walking, uh, uh, walking wounded. And the lieutenant and the master gunny sergeant were both dead. Now that's what you call black humor. There but for the grace of God. I saw lots of bodies that morning. Men that we were always associated with the machine gunners and uh, always worked together and some of my good friends. Totally gone. Totally gone. But we, uh, in fact, we landed, supposedly, if I recall right, we landed on the beach. There were 210, I think it was, in our company. And after this, County Walt of walk, uh, Walking Wounded, we were 58. But we went up uh, and continued up slowly up to the top of the mountain. And now the Japs at the top of the mountain, they were all dug in and they could uh, survey the entire island, see everything from that lofty position. But at night they didn't sleep up there, they would go back a little farther north of there, there was a jungle type of vegetation and they would settle in there just for the sleeping night and come back in the morning. Well, we had to get up there and the commander of our battalion decided that we were going up in the middle of the night, held together by fish little fish line. And as you go up, hold on to the fish line and slide it along with you so that the man behind you can follow that same fish line. Very secretive. And, uh, to me, at the, even then, I was saying, it doesn't sound like the Marine Corps to me. And I thought we just blasted our way through. Well, we didn't. And in fact, there was one time when I lost my Feel of the line, I couldn't see where I was in. It was the dead of night. There was no moon out or nothing. And I must have stepped a few paces off from the given line, and I had, I heard, who goes there? Big rough voice. And I said, oh my God, I'm a sudden duck. I said, so I yelled out, dibble, dibble. All right. So I found my way back up. Now we were there in the early morning. And uh, the Japs couldn't take it over anymore. The uh, battalion of the fourth, especially not the heck out of it. So 
so we were then in control. Uh, there was another, uh, another uh, what you call a uh, black humor that happened up there. Uh, being that I was wounded, I had to go see our Navy corpsman every morning who was stationed with us uh, to get rebandaged, put some salt and on it and everything else. Could you stop, please? Okay, um, I go past your time? <coughs> every morning I would uh, have to go over to the Navy corpsman. Every morning I had, would have to go to the Navy corpsman where he dressed me in new wounds for my wounds and uh, put on some sulfidizing and whatnot. Well, this particular morning, what first thing you would do is uh, relieve yourself, just like if you were back home in your own bed. And oh my God, the swelling in my groin. Absolutely scary. Ooh. We're talking about the crown jewels. And I was bewildered and scared. Uh, they were so swollen that it would be like if you held a balloon fully packed with air, ready to burst. And in your right hand, you got a needle. And you're scared that that needle somehow will find a way to puncture that balloon. It was, it was like that. So he didn't know. Make of that, so he sent me down below. They had a young first move, uh, lieutenant, uh, uh, maybe doctor, and he was bewildered by that. So he loaded me aboard a uh, jeep with two, three other patients, and we drove down to the beach, C Company. <coughs> and it was what, what, when it was my turn, the um, um, I came forward and exposed myself and uh, whatnot. And this, these doctors were the top of the line, these Navy doctors. They were from Johns Hopkins, one was Mayo, one was uh, California Berkeley, tops. And uh, this one, uh, the older man, I think he was John Hopkins, and he started chuckling. He says, you know, gentlemen, every island we go to, they've got their own kind of lights. Blinds we'll never see again, but they're there for that place. <laughs> he says, but while you're here, let's look at your room. Well, in the meantime, over the days and nights, the crust was scabbing. Uh, it wasn't a hard crust scab. It was moist. Uh, it was very hot there on in the daytime. And um, so he said, uh, he had the corpsman clean it up. Now, when you saw him do that, he, he had you sit on a gurney right there, in the big room, great big room. And he said, cleaned it up. I passed out. I totally passed out. And there was no feeling. All my nerves had been cut. So there was absolutely no feeling at all. What, na what was the nature of your wound? I know what happened in the shrapnel attack. Yeah. Or in the shelling. Yeah. Yes. But uh, that was, that's, the thing is, it was getting rancid, oh. if you want to use that word. And uh, in the dirt and squalor that you lived in and the bar involved in, uh, as this one old, old doctor said, he says, uh, I think he says, you don't know each other. But I, he probably didn't say it. <laughs> he says, if, if, you hadn't, if you hadn't come down with that groin thing of yours, you wouldn't have known, but you were on the beginning of game. Wow. So that's what you call it. The, uh, the other thing, you had been bitten by some kind of a bug, is that? Okay. And you had a 21-year-old man, you know. Yeah. Oh, my God. And they were able to give you something to... Oh, yeah, it was... You just went back down. Oh, it, was okay. funny. it was funny, but, uh, but I'll never forget that the doctor told me about <laughs> And, uh, you know, how lucky, if it hadn't been for that bug, yeah. I know, he still would be up on the top of that. The, the, uh, the injury to your arm. Yes. It was shrapnel from it was that. shrapnel. 
and it cut through the nerves, so you, you had no feeling whatsoever. Uh, uh, that um, and, and that's actually they kept me there, and that was only days before the end of the uh, campaign. Mm. Just the days they were all done with it. That's when all those children and women were jumping off the cliffs on the north side to leave the public Japanese propaganda and whatnot. Yeah. So after that, uh, 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 we just took it easy and uh, went down the canal and uh, met everybody else coming together to make that new 6th Division. And um, then in December of 44, uh, we were training in the jungles of Guadalcanal. And hum what humors me in reflection is that our next campaign was Okinawa. There were no jungles. In fact, a lot of it was open land for tank. It was tank country, open land. But no matter what, I, we, we always figured in the, in the core that whatever happens, it'll, it'll work its way out. We will take care of it. And uh, so we were down at the canal, and we had the natives there. They were lovely people. And um, oh, gosh, we had such funny things. We had land crabs that... Um, they come out in what, a mating time. They come out of the jungle and they go to the beach to mate. And our bivouac area there for our company was on near, right next to the beach. And they would have that click, clack, click. You'd wake up at, in the middle of the night and hear that click, clack, click, and you didn't know what the heck was going on. Some of the boys didn't take very good care with their netting over their cots, and some of them could find a crab at their feet. Ooh. <laughs> it, was, it was humorous and whatnot. But anyway, with, with myself personally, I uh, got a call in from uh, company headquarters, I think, and that I should leave all this uh, training and go over to company headquarters that afternoon. So I go over there. And a couple of officers uh, start throwing questions at me. I remember one of the questions. Would it be wisest for us to invade Japan directly or to go first to China, set up a good base, and then go across to Japan? And I don't know what this was going on, but I just said, well, as far as I can see, I'd rather just hit Japan straight off spread it out longer time, you're going to lose that way. So that was all there was to it. All of a sudden, I got the word to pack up. I was being sent back to the States. Well, and there was just a few others from the, from the whole uh, division that was going back with me. So we had an army, um, I forget what the, uh, it was a DC-4, I think, the new DC-4. Came along, picked us up, picked up other men from other areas and whatnot, flew us into Honolulu. And um, the, the thing was about it, that they had asked every one of us, uh, would you go for further training as junior officers? Well, you get out in the Pacific those campaigns, and you stay out there two years, and two and a half, and some of the boys were over three years. And somebody, you can ask that question to any man out there that all say they would like to go back to further training. Yes, get back to the States. White women and good boots. <laughs> and uh, because we had some unusual drinking things out there. Sure. Uh, so they flew us back. Treasure Island, San Francisco, and a um, remarkable situation there. We just held there for about two weeks, and then on the board, the, the train takes us all the way across the country over to uh, 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 Marine Base in the, in the East Coast. And then from there, they were, they were going to, those of us who had been out of college over, or any schooling for over three years, they were going to uh, ship us back for a given time, a year at the most, to
to tune us up on the mechanics of, uh, of thought patterns and all. And um, I had a choice. He said, I've got, we got three schools. We Cal Berkeley, Purdue, or Cornell. Well, normally I would have said Cal Berkeley, because I knew the San Francisco area. In fact, I have an old girlfriend. But she was one of those lovely type of women that when I went overseas, she was loyal. She did not date anybody. She didn't dance anymore. She didn't do anything. And when I came back uh, to San Francisco Bay that, uh, by the 1st of January, she had totally changed her personality. It was just, mm. Mm. And so I didn't want to go to Cal Berkeley. Purdue would be closer to my home. But Cornell, I used to raise chickens. I used to love to raise chickens. All kinds of bantams and everything else. And Cornell had a Professor Rice. I would read his books on chickens. He was Cornell University. So I signed up for Cornell. And they shipped me along with maybe another 80, I'm guessing, 80 uh, other uh, uh, non-commissioned officers and enlisted men and whatnot. And we were to get our tuned up training, so to speak, and um, get ready. And then after that, they would eventually, within the year, they would ship us down to Cap Captain June and go into officer training. But that was the gist of it. Um, marvelous time, great experience for me. But and we were uh, on the football team at Cornell. In those days, Cornell University played Army, Navy. They played uh, Ohio State. They played Michigan. And um, uh, and then later, now in, in these days, they 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 did not want to get into this fast track. Of football at the big university, so they and the whole Ivy League uh, just sent it back and, and uh, didn't mind it. But on our football team, I was right in, and in fact, the right halfback right behind me was Paul Robeson, Jr. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson, Sr. was a famous singer mm -hmm. and actor, and uh, he was a lovely guy, and we had a uh, fullback, a marine fullback, a bunch of Navy and in the line, and uh, we had a great time. And so the end of the war to us was just okay. about it. Where, where were you, or what did you think when you heard about the atomic bomb? Wow. Wow. Did, did you have a concept then of what no. that meant? Well, you could kind of guesstimate. Nothing extraordinary. Everything was rolling towards something like that. I mean, the war would have to end. You follow up the readings, uh, the magazines, the newspapers, and the radio, and, and everything was tending that way. I mean, things were falling apart for Japan, mm -hmm. bad. And um, uh, wow, especially the probably the boys, uh, the, probably the boys on, on campus there that were do, uh, destined to be engineers would have sensed it more deeply mm -hmm. than us. Did, uh, when, you, when you were like that site man, uh, I don't know if, like you were what's going on at the same time, were you cognizant of what was going on with other uh, Not that much. Units? Not that much at all, no. Okay. Well, oh, I would like to say we're talking before about black humor. It was, uh, now the the uh, Okinawa uh, invasion had already started, and I wasn't there because I was back in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the men just moved up another notch uh, to their next positions, uh, replacing me. And I wrote to two of them, and I believe it was maybe the third week of, I think it was May of 1945. Anyway, I got both letters back. 
both letters of I and written. K-I-K. In other words, that's also black humor. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't have been caught out of the jungles in uh, December of 44, I would have been standing exactly in the same spot as these two good boys. Mm -hmm. No more of me. I wouldn't have been here. Hmm. Well, you uh, got out of the military in November of uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. What you did? I, I returned to Cornell at the, at the GI Bill. It's an awful expensive school today. Mm -hmm. It's about 42000 a year for a kid. And I continued on there. But I got to a point after three years of, uh, of college, uh, I got to a point I did not know what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I had no I mean, I, I love the education. It's affected me all the rest of my life here. But I did not have any thought patterns. Uh, now, before the war, when I was at this little uh, college, I was going to be a uh, history major and a phi ed major. And I wanted to be a high school history teacher and coach the football and baseball teams in the afternoons. That was my but I didn't have that one. I was out of the service. And I really, uh, they asked me about it. Uh, Come on, you got to pick something out or they're not going to carry you on for or forever. So I uh, just made just made my three years and I said, That's, I don't think I had much time left anyway in the, uh, in the GI Bill. And I went back and uh, of all things, uh, over the years, I ended up as a real estate broker, mm. which did not require it in those days, and, and still today does not require a, a college degree. Mm. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with people, and I enjoyed the houses and all that. Was that here in the Detroit area? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So you relocated to Detroit. How did you relocate to Detroit from? Well, actually, before <coughs> that, before that, in the meantime, I was. I lived in different towns like Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, I was even in Annapolis. I would go down to New Orleans and Birmingham, Alabama. I lived for a while. I lived a couple of years in, uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Sales jobs. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. even though I did not go ahead and get a degree in college, uh, what they can't take away from you is the knowledge that right. you got. And that was a blessing. Okay. It's affected me ever since. You came uh, wearing your colors this morning. Yes. I'd like to be able to, uh, you can tell us what what it's all about. Uh, yeah, I know you're an officer, a president of the your organization. Yeah. Right now I'm commander of uh, Okay. Chapter 1818, the Military Order of the Purple Heart. Just put your uh, shoulder back a little bit for the camera. There we go. Now we're getting it very well. Okay. And what, what is this? These are men. These are men who have been wounded by the enemy in campaigns, battle, battle wounds by the enemy, and they come from all the services. Our biggest bunch would be obviously from the Army, and the, we've got a few of them that were battled, the Bulge Boys. Some were hit on the Normandy Beach, uh, some were in Italy. And um, we Marines, there's three of us there in our small little group, and, and we were from 1st and 2nd Divisions. And uh, uh, only one Navy fellow, and he was a, uh, uh, he was a, and a commander, uh, I think, and um, in the Navy. He asked me once, he says, what, what parts of the Navy are you most impressed with, the admirals? I says, no, the Navy corpsmen and the Seabees. They were the ones that were with us, mm -hmm. and they did so well with us. Mm -hmm. We appreciated what they had done. But it's a fine organization. The only thing about it is that it's so small. Uh, in, the old, in the whole country, there's only 37,000. Um, in the, in the, uh, uh, the veterans of uh, this uh, situation here with the Purple Heart, whereas, you know, uh, the American 
American Legion has got three million. The Veteran Foreign Wars have got 2.3 million. We're 37,000, but they're very proud. Uh, did you ever get married and have children? Yes, yes, definitely. It was a um, it was here in the Detroit area, marketing area, and I uh, met this girl. She um, uh, was from Paris, France, and um, all of a sudden I got the boom, boom, booms, and um, I just got married. And she was, she thought that was a great idea, and we had uh, three children. They, the only thing about it is that um, of the three children, which I don't find fault, but she insisted that we give them the right names. So we have uh, two daughters, Lisette, little Elizabeth, and Roxanne Annette, nice French names. And then our son is Bernard Francois, Bernard Francis. So I got that French influence of that. Are your children around the Detroit area? Uh, one's down in Monroe, Michigan, uh, and uh, married, and the children, and my uh, younger daughter is over in West Bloomfield, mm -hmm. which is on the west side of uh, the total metropolis area, mm -hmm. and then one daughter down in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. Okay. Is your wife still around? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's see, is there anything else you care to speak to this morning? No, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little surprised that I talked so long. I, I think it's been a very good interview. Uh, oh, you want to speak about the hat? Oh, why don't you take your hat off and hold it up for the... So we can see what... Uh, can I explain what those are for them? Well, you know, many military men have all the different little things on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, one unique thing about the Marine Corps, they never forget. And they're a Marine the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So all I did, wanted to do was just put in the Marine Corps here. Mm -hmm. And then if I can turn it around, just come in. And that's the second of the six divisions. Okay. Those are the, uh, I don't know if the camera's picking it up. This is the sixth division, and this is the second. Ah, there it is. It's picking it up now. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay, uh, let me see, is there anything that I can think of that we... You want to repeat that again, your brother? Where do you want to start? Your brother. Oh, well, my brother also was uh, was uh, Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, he was with the U.S. Navy, he was on a troop ship, and they were landing either Army or Marines on the beaches uh, of New Georgia Island back in the uh, summer of 43, and he was hit on the beach by shrapnel. They were shooting uh, mortars or, or two of pieces. Uh, so we were two out of two in my family. In your, uh, your arm, is it? did you have a lasting effect from your...? No, not at all. In fact, all the nerves came back. Nerves have a way of finding themselves again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I, I've actually had no problem whatsoever. Well, that's wonderful. I, I, I think I, I, my friends now in, the, in my group, I, you know, when you're hitting the lower part, mm -hmm. legs, you can't move around much, and they both, right. both are leg boys and uh -huh. hurt quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing that it would come back like that. But, but the human body does wonderful things. Yes, sometimes. it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I uh, I can't think of anything else to uh, to ask Harold, so uh, I think we're probably drawing to a close. All right. And I'd like to thank you for coming in today, and also thank you for your service. And as you know, we're all very proud of our military. I am too.
So, thank you very much. Thank you.